I seem to have a few too many choices here. Uh, I mean, I, I could go to the left or I could go to the right. I guess it can go back the way I came. I, I wish I, I wish there was a way I could make a decision here. You know, uh, it'd be really great if I knew where each of the paths went, and uh, you know, I should probably figure out what I want. Uh, you, you know, what where, where do I want to go with these paths? I mean, I know where it, what's down there, but I, I don't really know if that's if down there is what I really want, and I'm not even really sure what happens either way. So, you know, making decisions, ethically speaking, can be a lot like this. Uh, you know, so I'm fond of saying, you know, people complain about philosophy. They say that, well, philosophy and ethical theory in particular, it doesn't have any answers. Well, well no, it's not true. It's got lots of answers. It's just not all of them can be true together. Uh, in fact, it, it seems like you kind of have to make a choice. Uh, what are you going to do, morally speaking? Well, what Rawls is proposing is a uh, decision procedure for, for ethical theories. And the idea is uh, to put together a series of finite steps that, that can be executed uh, such that we, we'd be able to figure out, well, what we should do. Right? And that's what he's trying to do in this situation. He's trying to say, hey, uh, is there a decision procedure, a set of finite steps that results in you know, one and only one decision, or at least a set of compatible decisions, or you know, maybe one is just as good as another, uh, in order to figure out how to live our lives. And he thinks there's an answer. Well, let, let's see what I can do with this. Well, the first thing we need for this decision, people, is we need the, the right people, sorry, for this decision procedure, is we need the right people involved. Right? We need uh, competent moral judges. Well, you know, what's going to be involved in this? Now, now for uh, Rawls, a moral judge isn't necessarily going to be somebody who already has virtues intact, right? Uh, first, he's, he's starting out with... Uh, you know, the, the, what we might call the intellectual virtues of this person. What kind of qualities in terms of intelligence does this competent moral judge need? And the first thing, it needs uh, this competent moral judge needs normal intelligence. Right? So the point of this is you don't have to be Stephen Hawking in order to figure out how you ought to live your life or uh, figure out what the right course of action is. I mean, it's not bad to be Stephen Hawking to figure that out, but you don't need to be Stephen Hawking. You need to have uh, at least normal intelligence. The second thing is, uh, you know, this person not only is reasonably intelligent, but also sufficiently well informed. So uh, this person has to have a pretty good idea of how the world is and what are the consequences of actions, right? or even just the consequences of events. How, you know, what's the causal network of things? How do people interact? What would be the result if uh, uh, you said a certain thing in a certain situation? That, that sort of deal. The third thing is that this competent moral judge has to be a reasonable person, and there's several traits involved in, uh, for, for Rawls for a reasonable person. The first is that the, this person, a reasonable person, uh, is going to be pretty well versed in inductive logic. Now, inductive logic is the logic of probability, so what's most likely to be the case given certain evidence. <clears throat> this is opposed to uh, deductive logic, which is uh, the logic of necessity, so what must be the case. Uh, given certain evidence. All right. Uh, in addition to uh, being able to use inductive logic, uh, a person, a reasonable person, is going to imagine not just reasons to perform an action, but also reasons to not perform it. So a reasonable person is going to consider both sides of the issue, why something should be done and why something shouldn't be done. Uh, it, another way of thinking about this is that uh, a reasonable person is going to consider all uh, uh, is going to consider all viewpoints. Okay. So uh, inductive logic, the uh, um, uh, use of inductive logic, and being able to consider all, all these different viewpoints. Uh, in addition to considering all the different viewpoints, 
such a reasonable person has to be open-minded. Now, this doesn't mean that you know the reasonable person is just flighty and 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 changes his or her mind all the time. No, what it means is it doesn't even mean that a reasonable person can't reach a conclusion. Of course, you have to be able to reach a conclusion in order to have this decision procedure. However, you know. It's, it's perfectly fine for a reasonable person to reach a conclusion and to, and to draw an inference. But if new, new evidence comes to light, or maybe even a new way of reasoning about the evidence, then a reasonable person has to be able to consider that and perhaps even consider changing the judgment based upon the new evidence or the new way of looking at the evidence. And what we might call being open-minded. In addition to that, uh, a reasonable person has to be pretty self-aware. I mean, we all have our emotional reactions to things. We all have our preferences, our own values. And it's not that these are bad. But a reasonable person is going to do his or her best to be aware of when those personal psychological characteristics might influence a decision. And you know, influence the decision in a way that, that the, uh, uh, emotion, the psychological characteristics will be irrelevant with regard to this decision. So we've got normal intelligence, pretty well informed, and reasonable. And such a person, uh, you know, doesn't necessarily hold on to any particular view, mind you, uh, but you know, possesses these these qualities. This sort of person is going to be a competent moral judge. I forgot one characteristic for a competent moral judge. You know, after, you know, not only normal intelligence, pretty well informed what the world is like, uh, being reasonable, a competent moral judge also has to be sympathetic. Now, for sympathetic, uh, you know, there's a couple of different ways a person can be sympathetic. The idea behind sympathy is being able to understand what interests are like, uh, what's good for people, and what people want, and how they're trying to live their life. So, a sympathetic person ideally should be able to experience these interests. Right? These interests, broadly construed, are, are what's good for people, what people want. You sh uh, the, uh, ideally, a sympathetic moral judge should have experienced all these interests. Now, it's just not going to happen. Right? Uh, nobody's going to be able to experience all of these all these interests. But uh, uh, you know, all hope is not lost because, you know, likely we have a very <laughs> vivid imagination. You know, if they haven't actually experienced these interests, then this person, this competent moral judge, must be able to imagine what it's like to have that interest. Okay, so, I mean, just as a really far-fetched, uh, not far-fetched, but one example, uh, you know, I've had a rather comfortable life as far as food and shelter is concerned. I haven't really been without either one. But, uh, that doesn't mean I can't imagine what it's like to be without either one of those. Uh, I, I probably can't get it in full detail. I haven't experienced it completely to be without food or, 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 or shelter. Uh, one night I was <laughs> one night I was locked out of my car downtown and I had to wait until uh, my where I worked opened back up again so I, so I could get my car keys. So I actually wound up like walking around the streets of downtown for a night. And it wasn't particularly it was a little cool that night, but it wasn't so bad. But that was a smidgen of an experience of what it's like to be without shelter, of having no place to go. A very, very small. So I'm not saying I understand completely what it's like to be without a home, but, you know, that, that, that's kind of, uh, that helps in the imagination. You know, I've skipped a meal or two, so I, I, I know a little bit of what it's like to be hungry. A smidgen. Now, Given that, I'm able to imagine what it's like to have that severe interest to something of an idea of what it's like to be hungry for days. Right? That, that desperation that probably creeps in. Same thing with uh, not being able to go home. I know it's like to be lost on the streets. I mean, I know where I am, but I've got nowhere to go. Okay. So, if you can't, so to be able to experience this interest, if you can't experience this interest, then be able to imagine what these interests are like. And finally, this sympathetic person has to consider that one's own interests are not the most important or the only important interests. That other people's interests are also important. <clears throat> In other words, the sympathetic person has to, well, consider that 
you know, he or she is not alone in the world and not the only one that matters. A Farol, in contrast to a competent moral judge, is you know, who we might call the ideologue. The ideologue is a person that adheres to an ideology, and as, as, Rawls, as Rawls defines this, uh, this ideology is the claim that you know, a, a person or a group of people have an unconditional claim to the truth simply in virtue of membership to a certain group or a class. Right? Uh, you know, it could be race, could be uh, belief, could be uh, social class, uh, this sort of thing. Now, uh, to the extent that membership in this class excludes uh, any of the uh, qualities of a competent moral judge, and it looks like they kind of all do, um, you know, the ideologue is not a competent moral judge. So you think about it, you know, what, if, what if we say is required for a uh, competent moral judge? You need to be reasonably intelligent. Let's grant that that's the case, right? It's, you know, you can be an ideologue and have, to be, and have normal intelligence. Uh, you might even be sufficiently informed about the world, maybe. Right? Sometimes that's not going to be the case. Sometimes the way the world is is colored by our worldview, right? And uh, you know, it's even warped by our worldview. So you know, maybe the second condition there it fails, uh, but the third condition definitely fails with the ideologue. I mean, the ideologue is not going to be open to a new evidence, right? All that matters to the truth is membership in the class. That's that's all you need. Uh, not going to, probably not necessarily going to be. Uh, schooled in inductive logic. I mean, it'd be weird to be schooled in inductive logic and to adhere to the truth simply because of membership of class. Th those two don't really seem to fit. Ideologues probably aren't going to consider all sides of the issue either. Right? All that really matters is what the group says or what, what the membership of the class says. So an ideologue is, is going to fail as a competent moral judge primarily because uh, it's going to fail these conditions for being reasonable. So uh, we've got, yeah, our first main component is, is a competent moral judge for our decision procedure. Uh, we're also going to leave out ideologues as competent moral judges. So what do we have left? Well, we got to, I mean, these judges are going to be making decisions. They're going to be making judgments. So uh, what would be required of these, of these considered moral judgments, you know, the ones that we're going to take a look at? Um, well, these considered moral judgments are... You know, it can't just be anything that the competent world judge says. I mean, it might be competent, but it's not just like anything goes. These uh, judgments have to meet certain conditions themselves. I mean, first of all, the uh, judge uh, can neither be harmed nor benefit from the decision. So I think what Ross is getting at here is uh, this is a way to maximize or guarantee impartiality in the decision. The judge can't be harmed by, can't suffer any backlash or uh, can't uh, um, you know, be negatively or harmfully impacted by the decision. Similarly, the judge can't benefit from it either. So uh, this competent moral judge uh, can either uh, be harmed or benefit from the action. He can't be involved in it at all. <clears throat> uh, thirdly, I mean, so ne next, uh, um, this decision, whatever it is, has to involve actual interests. So uh, I think what uh, Ross is getting at here is we're, we're not going to deal with hypothetical cases. We've got to deal with what's in front of us. Right? These judges might react differently or uh, judge differently if we're just dealing with hypotheticals. But we've got to deal with what's actually in front of us. Right? So it's actual cases. Next, uh, all the relevant information has to be gathered. Right? If we don't have uh, enough information, it's not a considered moral judgment. We can't... And, you know, the relevant information is, you know, who's going to be impacted by it and how and uh, when are they going to be impacted by it and, you know, what are the interests involved and that sort of thing. Next, the judge must be confident in the decision. Uh, without that confidence, uh, a, a judge, in, in the judge's own view, probably isn't making the right decision. Right? Or, so, 
I mean, we're relying upon the competency of these judges, and if the judge says, eh, I don't know if I'm really doing that, well, the judge is discrediting his or her own judgment. The judgments must be stable. Now, this is kind of, this might not be immediately obvious what, what Rawls is talking about here, but they have to be stable in the sense that, you know, the similar judgments are going to be made in similar circumstances. If there's wide variety in these judgments, then it doesn't look like there's uh, any real good reason to, I mean, since we're relying on these judges as the basis for, for this decision procedure, without the stability, without similar judgments in similar circumstances, we're not going to be able to figure out what to do. Uh, it would be arbitrary at that point. And last, <clears throat> these uh, competent moral judges must be making these judgments off of uh, intuitions. Now, to understand what he means by intuitions, he means intuitions as opposed to complex moral theories. So we've seen a lot of moral theories over the course of the semester, but a competent moral judge must be, must be making decisions based upon uh, you know, the, these immediate judgments, these ones that, uh, these immediate principles, these ones that we don't reason to. So if you're walking by a fountain and you see a little girl drowning, right, your immediate what you immediately think is, I need to pull her out of the fountain. Or, uh, it's better to tell the truth than to lie. Or, uh, I shouldn't steal. Or, um, what? Uh, all things considered equal, don't kill. Right? Now, it doesn't take a whole lot of reasoning to, to have these immediate uh, uh, principles. And this is what the competent moral judge should be using. Should be using these principles these intuitions. A competent moral judge shouldn't be using complex principles. So when you have all these conditions together, then you have a considered moral judgment. And the idea is that you have somebody with good enough capacities, with the requisite capacities, using one's own intuitions to determine what's right or wrong. So we've got two out of three components for our decision procedure. We've got the competent moral judges, and we've got the considered moral judgments. The next step is explication. Now the idea of an explication is that these judges have been working for a while, and they've amassed uh, quite a large set of considered moral judgments. Now what we're going to do is take these judgments and try to figure out the principle. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you know, this is what we do in uh, in the physical sciences. We look at uh, uh, events that are correlated with each other in relevant circumstances, and then we infer that the first event causes the second, that sort of thing. So, uh, we're doing the same thing here. We're looking at different circumstances, relevant facts about the world. And uh, in these different situations, these different facts about the world, uh, we've found uh, competing interests. Okay. And uh, in these competing interests, these common moral judges have said, well, interest for this situation, for, for this person, should be preferred over others. Okay. So we just, we start amassing these judgments and we start correlating, we start figuring out, well, what are the circumstances in which whose preferences, in which, in, in, what are the circumstances in which some particular person's or group of people's preferences are preferred over others? So, uh, there are certain conditions that these explications have to meet. First of all, they can't require any special language or any special training to understand them. They have to be pretty straightforward. Because again, we, you know, I think what Ross is getting at here in requiring normal intelligence and uh, these you know, plain language principles is that morality can't be a specialty discipline. Right? Morality has to be something that anybody can do. I mean, if it's going to be a decision procedure, everybody's got to be able to do it. Okay, so uh, they have to be plain language and require no special training. Secondly, these, these principles involved, uh, given this explication, have to tell us the facts, the relevant facts, have to tell us the competing interests, and in the, you know, in the situation with relative facts and competing interests, then which interests are to, are to be preferred, which interests are to be uh, given the weight here. All right. So they should prescribe an action. And finally, these explications ought to be comprehensive and they ought to be, in some sense, unified. So, um, this is related to the idea of stability, where similar judgments in similar circumstances. 
this, they, they ought to be unified or comprehensive in the sense that there, there should be some way that uh, they're all unified or, or ideally all unified under one principle. Or if they're not identified under one principle, some reason why there's going to be difference in these principles. And ideally, the, these principles ought to in some sense support each other. They can't just be, you know, just do this then and do that there. No. They ought to, they ought to have some kind of reason why, uh, you know, they ought to tell, one principle ought to be, give some kind of information on why another principle is also right. So they ought to be what we might call coherent. Or, so um, when we have all this in place, Rawls says, we've got competent moral judges making considered moral judgments. We are able to draw out, to abstract out the explications. And when we have these explications, when we have these principles that we can follow, then we have our decision procedure for actions. Because these principles will be able to tell us how we are to live our life.